I really want Rivian to make it. They've built such an incredible product and an amazing brand, but I'd be denying reality to say, oh, yeah, they're losing some money right now, but they'll figure it out down the road. No, Rivian has to cut spending, and I mean by a lot. I highly recommend you check out Hyper Changes' video on Rivian's current cash burn rate. And just to summarize that video's point, it is nowhere near what Tesla's was, even at their worst. Tesla was looking at negative 17% gross margin in in the middle of production hell when all the odds were stacked against them and the Model S and X were actually profitable pretty early on for Tesla because they were fairly efficient designs and they weren't as complicated and we're seeing higher with more like negative 40% margins on their R1 vehicles. It's much much worse than Tesla's worst and because I want the R2 and the R3 to make it to market, today's video is basically kind of a guide slash wish list on things Rivian could do to cut costs, to cut spending, to achieve profitability or at least a break-even point faster than what their current trajectory is and a lot of the ideas I suggest in today's video might have you going well you're just turning Rivian into Tesla these are all Tesla things well uh, one of the Tesla things is also profitability Tesla has a large cash pile and they can sell their vehicles at a profit so they may continue to exist and come up with new products and services and upgrade their vehicles to make them more desirable as needed you kind of need profitability for the company to stick around ramp up the Rivian R2 and R3 are going to be very, very tight times for the company, and they're already pretty tight as is with how much money they're losing on the R1 vehicles. So, first order of business, if RJ put Drew in charge of Rivian, is that we're going to announce the quad motor powertrain is available while supplies last. In other words, scrap production of the quad motor, at least for now. I'm not saying you could never bring it back, especially with an in-house designed enduro quad motor system that would be more efficient and probably more capable but during this initial startup phase where you're running low on cash, I think Rivian needs to simplify their powertrain situation as much as possible. And there's just so many people going with the dual motor already. It's fast, it's capable, it still does great off-road. I've seen countless off-roading videos with the dual motor. Yes, quad motor has some extra drive mode options, which are really cool, but most people aren't specking for it because it's just too dang expensive. And if your complaint is, well, Drew, some people are willing to pay for quad motor, well, don't worry because there's a ton of quad motor R1 T's and R1 S's in inventory and Rivian's having a hard time selling them because the prices are too high they don't offer that many advantages over dual motor at least that many that people are willing to pay for and Rivian is already having to get more creative with their lease options and they're offering more discounts on vehicles that are already not profitable so I just say stop making quad motor and just the ones that are available in inventory say those are you know the limited edition and maybe that might increase the desirability of them a little bit to know that they're not going to be available forever and it would simplify the assembly line to just have dual motor and dual motor performance which are mostly just software differences and personally I'd be totally fine if Rivian allowed like a dual motor performance boost option after delivery so if you bought the cheapest dual motor package afterwards down the road you could unlock it to be faster via software update Tesla's had some success with that in the past and it allows Rivian to collect some more profits on the back end and some people may not like this one but again desperate times desperate measures but I think Rivian should relocate the charge port to the driver's side rear yes the same charge port location as Tesla's vehicles and I think it should be next they're doing a factory shutdown this summer so I think there's some time to rethink the high voltage wiring RJ in interviews has already mentioned that the high voltage wiring has to be extended a lot further away from the battery pack to get it onto the front of the vehicle which is partially why they're moving the charge port to the rear on the R2 and the R3. I just think they put it on the wrong end of the rear because vast majority of chargers that Rivian customers are going to be using, hate to break it to you, are Tesla superchargers and those are all going to be optimized for the driver's side rear because that's what Teslas have. And sure, maybe some V4s in the future will make it easier for different charge port locations, but V4s are not rolling out that quickly. Tesla is still installing, as we speak, more and more V3 superchargers with the shorter cables and having to occupy two stops is going to be annoying and frustrating for your customers. You want to increase the desirability of the product while making it cheaper, relocating to the driver's side rear, basically embedding it within that little tail light on the back. That should allow Rivian to not occupy multiple stalls and have 15,000 superchargers at the ready and you don't have to worry about having to park on a curb or park in some awkward manner. Yes, it'll probably make towing a little bit harder because you might have to unhook the trailer a lot, but EV towing is already a big mess no matter where the charge port is. 
is. So I would just say take the L on the occasional EV fast charging while towing thing and focus more on what most people are using their Rivians for just road tripping and having access to a ton of DC fast chargers that are reliable and have plug and charge and you can just back in like all the other Teslas and plug in. And that brings me to another controversial decision for number three. A lot of people aren't going to like this one, but again, think of it as more of a temporary cost cutting measure to ensure the future of the company long term. And that would be to stop slash significantly slow down the growth of the adventure network. Tesla is doing all of the work for you if you're willing to relocate that NAX charge port. There are way more superchargers than any other charge station. No one's going to want to use Electrify America anymore once Tesla becomes available. Tesla's got more stations. The uptime of superchargers are way better. And if you rely more on that, you won't have to spend so much money on growing out the adventure network. Yes, relocating the NAX charge port will also make the adventure networks a little bit more complicated because they still have the CCS cables and they're optimized for the driver's side rear. But you know, there's less than 200 or 300 adventure network chargers, but there's over 15,000 Tesla superchargers. By the way, Tesla's growing their supercharger network much, much faster than Rivian is. Why spend all this money to build out your own network when Tesla can do all the work for you? And because Tesla's already got the much bigger network anyway, I would just say, let them do the heavy lifting and Rivian, you can focus more on profitability and instead of burning money on adventure network chargers you can use that money to develop the r2 line and get that georgia plant operational and more importantly get that r3 line up and running and again all of these production lines that they're going to have to build up from scratch is not going to be cost competitive so slowing down slash stopping the growth of the adventure network short-term solution i'm not saying when you're more profitable in the future you can't come back and improve on that network in fact i think tesla would be the great solution for all of the day-to-day -day road tripping just on interstates and freeways and then in the future when Rivian is more profitable they can make the adventure network just focus on more remote locations that are kind of out far away from all of the major freeways and interstates rather than have to try to build out your own network from scratch and have to put them all right next to Tesla superchargers it's just not necessary number four is also going to be a tough one and Rivian has actually started doing this already but I would just encourage them to keep doing it I would cut down on the paint entire options. I don't care which paint colors or tire options you cut down on, but simplifying the assembly process and not requiring so much trims and options is one of the ways Tesla has been able to simplify and streamline assembly to make it move a lot more faster and make it a lot more profitable. So I would just say whatever the two or three least common paint color options are or tire options are, just drop those. And of course you can bring them back down the road when you're more profitable, but right now when your cash pile is dwindling, just focus on the most popular color options. A lot of people are going to wrap them anyway, and people can buy aftermarket tire options and stuff like that. So keep the most popular options, but whatever the least popular options are, Rivian probably has the data on that. Just drop them for now to save money. And yes, I'm afraid I would also do the same thing with the interior options. Right now, they have like four or five different interior color choices. All of that complexity results in more time, more money that needs to be spent on the assembly line to make time to have options for what everybody is looking for. And I would just strip it down to two, have a darker interior and a lighter interior and just call it a day, whichever the cheapest interiors are to build. I know that might frustrate some people, but I think what would frustrate more people is if the company went bankrupt. So focus on simplifying the interior and exterior color options. And if the factory line is going to be shut down for potentially a couple of months anyway, I think this would be a great time for Rivian to optimize for 800 volt architecture. We know it's possible with the Tesla Cybertruck and the GM all electric Hummer that you can build an 800 volt system that is still capable of fast charging pretty good with a 400 volt DC fast charger. And with an 800 volt architecture, you can use thinner wiring, which is more efficient, should reduce your weight, should reduce the number of amps you have to run through the high voltage system. So in the same way that the Hummer and Cybertruck are able to split the pack down to 400 volt to access all of the V3 superchargers, I would suggest Rivian come up with a system like that so that as more and more 800 volt systems come online, you can fast charge them at higher speeds than what Rivian is currently limited to, which is about 220 kilowatts. With an 800 volt system, they should be able to reach those 300 kilowatt speeds, and that could increase the desirability of the product while simultaneously making it more efficient, hopefully in the long run, cheaper to produce as well. But we know Tesla has been sending everybody their manual on how to develop a 48 volt system. We know 48 volt saves on a lot of wiring cost and can reduce a lot of weight, specifically on larger vehicles that have a lot of appliances and accessories. That's where these high
higher voltages tend to have the most amount of savings and we know that the r1t and r1s have a lot of bells and whistles they got all kinds of displays and they've got ports and outlets and air compressors so if we switched all of those little electronics to 48 volts that should also help them a lot with reducing cost and i also think that low voltage battery should make the switch to lithium ion so that it lasts a lot longer rather than what most of the industry is still using lead acid which eventually after a certain number of years goes bad and then you got to service it we don't need to clog up the rivian service centers any more than they already are so i would say just you know streamline and simplify that low voltage system with the high voltage system and something that rj has actually confirmed they're doing with the r2 and the r3 platform but since the r1 lines are going to be shut down this summer i think they could hopefully bring it to the r1 early would be to add a heat pump and an octo valve because this is something that allows tesla to achieve pretty good range and pretty great efficiency even in the winter time and it's something currently missing on the r1t and r1s sure because it's such a large vehicle heat pump is probably not going to make as big a difference but it ties into the battery pack later which i'll get into but it's clearly the future for preconditioning and battery management systems and electric vehicles and i think rivian should just kind of get on with the times because efficiency matters when the battery pack is so big and so expensive if you can make that smaller and still get the same amount of range or close to the same amount of range as before that allows you to save a lot of money on the overall vehicle which brings me to my next point which i know is going to tick off a lot of people but my hope here that i'm gunning for is that thanks to the 800 volt high voltage architecture and the 48 volt low voltage architecture plus with that heat pump and everything i just talked about it's not just so that they could extend their range it's actually so that they could use smaller battery packs in every r1t and r1s because the battery pack is the most expensive part of the vehicle all of this stuff is somewhat trivial if you still have 135 kilowatt hour battery packs in these things that's the size of the large pack at least and i would advise rivian to kind of skim it down thanks to the more efficient wiring and the heat pump maybe with an octo valve and having access to the tesla supercharger network and having the nax port in the proper location maybe that would make your customers feel a bit more comfortable with a slightly lower range number the number i had in my head for the battery pack size was the large becomes 120 kilowatt hours instead of 135 and then the standard battery pack instead of being you know 110 like it is now could become around 100 kilowatt hours or slightly less than that and with those smaller battery packs hopefully with more efficiency we could still get around 270 miles of range for the standard and maybe like 330 miles of range for the large pack knowing that you have access to the best supercharger network and you won't need an adapter and you won't have to occupy two stalls i think that would make a lot of people feel more comfortable with less range the 350 mile range in the large pack currently is great and i know a lot of people love that but again rivian's burning a lot of money so i'm looking for ways to cut cost and looking for ways to compromise a little bit and try to make the r1 vehicles a bit more profitable and on that same subject of battery pack sizes and simplifying the assembly line i would also cut out the max pack i know it looks good on paper to have a 400 mile range but it really doesn't translate to that in the real world i've seen videos comparing the large pack to the max pack and it really doesn't result in any better trip time especially if you're towing then it's only a difference of like 20 miles and it costs the customer an extra ten thousand dollars so personally i would just end production of the max pack and there's still a lot of them in inventory so you could do the same thing with the max pack as you did with the quad motor and just say it's available while supplies last that increases the rarity of it and makes it feel a little bit more special might uptick the demand for it just a little bit near the end to clear out inventory same thing with those quad motors you could include you know lifetime premium connectivity with those options or something give them 10,000 miles of free adventure network charging to try to sweeten the deal but i know a lot of these changes i keep bringing up people are going oh man you're making the product so much worse less colors less interior choices less tire options less range i know it sounds hard but i did include in my list a few things to actually increase the desirability of the product that hopefully shouldn't cost rivian too much because i know they can't just make the product worse and worse and worse otherwise no one's going to want to buy it here's a few things on my list that i don't think would be too expensive that would make a lot of people more interested in the r1 line so first step a lot of people seemed impressed with the r2 and r3's updated scroll wheel design with haptic feedback and their dynamic so you get a different number of ticks based on what ui you're looking at so i would say bring that really cool steering wheel that everybody was so impressed with to the r1 lineup i'm pretty sure they wouldn't make a more expensive steering wheel for their cheaper cars so if they've already kind of got a design picked out i would say bring it to the r1 which is basically already in production now you're already going to be upgrading 
upgrading that assembly line and you'll have a supply chain and a production down on it by the time the r2 comes into production you're gonna have to scale up that steering wheel design anyway so those scroll wheels look epic and amazing please rivian bring those to the r1 first also they were able to add two glove boxes to the r2 and r3 design if you're tweaking the assembly line a little bit i'd say at least add one maybe you can't fit the two in the r1 vehicle because more dated design or something like that but just give it a glove box so people have some more storage space in the front and personally if we're looking at ways to cut cost on the interior i would just scrap the bluetooth speaker i've seen a lot of rivian reviews and a lot of people say they never even access that i mean you can sell it as an accessory in the gear shop if people really want it but including it on every single vehicle off the assembly line i think that might be a bit much and we really got to start looking at the pennies here to try to make these vehicles more profitable so similar to the r2 and the r3 you can just have a little drawer down there and it can be a drawer you can completely take out and put third-party accessories in if you want so the people who really want the bluetooth speaker can go out and buy one but everyday customers yeah they don't need to pay for that a lot of people will never access it and i'm not entirely sure if this seat design is possible to retrofit to the r1 but a lot of people seem really impressed with the r2 and r3 having the option to fold all of the seats flat including the front row seats and i'm guessing it's a fairly simple mechanism because they put it in their cheaper cars those cheaper cars just aren't out yet so i would tweak the seat design of the r1t and r1s to let people fold the seats down completely flat in the front as well as the back which might make the r1t even that much more interesting for car camping if you don't want to use a tent if you want to have a hvac controlled sealed off from the elements camping experience and it would definitely give you a ton of space for car camping in the r1s and something that could help with the insurance rates and not clogging up the service centers is to tweak the rear quarter panel design that got rivian a lot of bad press when people found out that through a minor fender bender you could end up damaging this huge panel on the side of the rivian that's just one piece and that's why the repairs ended up being like forty thousand dollars which is ridiculous so if you could just break up that panel a little bit to make the rear quarter panel a lot more serviceable without having to take off the whole roof line and service the cab wiring as well as the bed cover and other basic things that rivian has said that they're gonna do but still haven't for some reason that could help them cut costs don't include unlimited premium connectivity with every single r1 sold you could include it with the inventory models that have the more data design you know like the quad motor or the max battery pack maybe they have unlimited premium connectivity but for the new vehicle sold with the nax port in the better place and the updated steering wheel and all that maybe just 30 days of the premium connectivity and then after that it falls back to standard connectivity where you know you don't have the wi-fi hotspot in the car anymore and you don't have the satellite views and you don't have the music streaming that's what tesla does and i think people are happy to pay 10 bucks a month or if you launch your own rivian referral program and you refer other people and can rack up rivian credits or whatever you can use those credits on premium connectivity and i think people would be happy to pay a slight membership to access those features rather than rivian doing what they're doing right now and just give it all away for free you can do that when you're a big profitable company but right now you're losing cash fast and i think they need to focus more on actually turning a profit before r2 production begins because r2 production is going to eat through a ton more cash so you gotta have a cash pile ready to go by 2026 and right now it's not looking like that's going to happen what other ideas or suggestions do you guys have for rivian in terms of how to cut costs let me know down in the comments below and thank you to everybody supporting this channel directly seriously helps us out a ton as does just watching these videos so thanks again have an excellent rest of your day